I'm going to, the theme of my talk is Dignity Beyond Indignity. Perhaps unusually, I have uh, opposite my front door a photograph of a man with leprosy drinking in the street. I do like this picture despite the odds. There is nothing, of course, to celebrate about leprosy. It's an appalling disease that is suffered uh, vastly disproportionately by the poor and disenfranchised, and it leads to great suffering through secondary consequences. The sensation of pain is lost, and blindness and disfigurement are common in its victims. Despite the fact that it's easily cured and uh, easily enough prevented, uh, still the World Health Organization uh, estimates that some 200,000 new cases came up in 2014 alone. But the man in the picture is not defined by his disease, nor indeed by the deprivation which gave it to him. He is a figure of life and intrigue in a colorful scene that is so perfect that it could almost be staged. It isn't, though. It's a photograph, I think, which demands a story, a punchline. That story, though, is simply the intrinsic dignity of a man treated as a pariah, an outcast by his society. It's his story of his need for water, just like mine, of the dexterity of his manner as he drinks that water, of his inexplicable command of the attention of all those around him as he stands center stage. The photograph is by Marcus Perkins, uh, a wonderful collaborator whom I am proud to call my friend. I approached him for this work several years ago after scratching my head for an accessible way to communicate the myriad forms of marginalization, victimization, discrimination, and violence suffered by the once called untouchable people of India, the Dalits. What I wanted to do was to find a way to provoke a sense of solidarity that span across unbridgeable gulfs of society, of culture, of language, and of economy, to provoke a sense of compassion and of uh, calling for justice. And all the tools that we had at our disposal for this seemed inadequate. There were statistics that were hard to get our heads around, that according to the census data we had available, the number of Dalits uh, was equivalent to the combined populations of the UK France and Spain. But somehow, quantitative data is never enough to make us care. There were nuances and subtleties that defied easy explanation but were too important to be ignored. We could make no easy correlations between caste and wealth or power. But then there were the people behind these impenetrable walls. What could be done to present their stories with the authenticity that they deserved and to forge a sense of connectedness to them and their tribulations. So we turn to photography as a medium to open some vignettes into the dramatic and the banal ways in which untouchability is experienced. Of course, nothing would have been possible without people opening their lives and their homes to us, sharing their stories and their routines. And that, in turn, would not have been possible without community leaders and activists vouching for us, people who lead the local struggles for change. This is their story. But so it was that, lubricated very frequently by Chai, we set out to create a set of photographs which conveyed the fundamental dignity and beauty and the often terribly sad stories of those marked as untouchable. <coughs> Jaya, uh, pictured here, was the sister of a street sweeper, the breadwinner of his family. The family would never be rich, but they got on okay. For them, this was a story of stunted opportunity, living in an area segregated from the rest of the village because of the polluting influence that they brought. And then there was Uma. Uma's story uh, her job, by virtue of birth, was to gather up human excrement from a dry latrine in her village in southern Andhra Pradesh, which she carried on a basket on her head. She carried it to a dumping ground. There were more than 800,000 people who carried out the same task on a daily basis. 
They often find themselves unable to eat, prone to disease, dying young because of the work that they carried out. <coughs> and yet, in a bizarre twist of irony, Uma's own home had a toilet. She was above the indignity that society around her foisted upon her. Now, when the body of work was finished, we called it being untouchable. There was the young girl thrown onto a heap of burning ashes in reprisal because she trod on a path uh, reserved for those more socially elevated. The young man whose home was burned <coughs> down and destroyed in an act of caste violence. The community known as rat eaters because of the extremity of their poverty, who, despite all of it, their daughters uh, demanded education. Then there were the temple prostitutes, the destitute, the child laborers, the victims of violence, the rubbish pickers, and on it went. Now the resulting exhibition uh, went first to a gallery in Old Street in London, then on to St. Paul's Cathedral. It was featured by uh, a variety of media, including the BBC and the Guardian. We printed them on, uh, under a tough laminate, which people could run their fingers over, repudiating untouchability with touch. Now, I don't make any great claims for the impact <coughs> of this work as a piece of advocacy, but we believe that simply to illuminate the, the deep dignity of those suffering daily humiliation uh, and to invite the viewer to meet them on an equal footing was itself a small transformative act, appealing to the basic human instinct for solidarity which can overpower all that separates us. There are many easy ways to reinforce separation. We are so often prone to language which builds barriers, closes doors. We who do human rights work need to take care to avoid language which distances and objectifies language of victims, of rights holders. Nobody, of course, is defined solely <coughs> by victimhood. But more than that, if we're not careful, the language we use in conversations in the media, in politics, creeps towards a dehumanizing quality, reinforcing otherness and creating categories which become intractable. Perhaps none is more chilling than the words we use for the stranger among us, the illegal, the alien. Now, of course, identity is profoundly important. We need categories to define ourselves and our place in the confusing tangle of the world and its history. We need to belong to groups to classify ourselves and those around us. But when we solidify these groups too much, our consequent failure to recognize the humanity in each other is one of the root causes of our injustices towards <coughs> one another. I think we are all guilty of this. Our need for self-justification leads us to tell exclusionary narratives. I am different from you, therefore superior. We are better than they are. Every ism, racism, sexism, casteism, is built on this foundational myth of superiority and a failure to recognize in the other the commonality of our humanity. And so as we fight against injustice, what can we do to pull back the curtain of this delusion? What can we do to move from exclusion to solidarity? How can we recognize the humanity in each other as the starting point for our interaction together? Recognizing, uh, beginning, sorry, with a trajectory of reconciliation rather than rejection. If my small experiments with a photographer have taught me anything, it's that there's something deeply transformative about recognition. Beginning with a recognition of dignity, of equality, of humanity in the other, we can demand much more of ourselves in confronting the ugliness of the world. Because what truly matters more than to reimagine the horror of the world as beauty? To touch the one considered untouchable. To love the one thought unlovable. How are you going to do it? Thank you.